Good morning, Whitney Church. Hi there. It is so awesome to see you guys every Sunday that you come in here. If you're watching online, we love to uh, have you participating on that level as you're comfortable. Um, if you have one of these things, please put it on silence for the uh, uh, convenience and lack of annoyance of your neighbors. And um, take right. it away, Kevin. Well, as Bert said, welcome to worship <clears throat> on this beautiful morning here at Whitney United Methodist Church. Um, please stand as you are able as we sing our opening song, Spirit Song. Oh, let the Son of God unfold you with His Spirit and His love. Let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have those things that hold you, and a spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you whole. Jesus, oh Jesus. your hearts are filled with joy. Lift your hands in sweet surrender to his name. Oh, give him all your tears and sadness. Give him all your years of pain. And you'll enter into life in Jesus' name. Jesus, oh Jesus. Good morning, and welcome to our worship at Whitney United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Daryl Blanksma. It's good to see you all here. It's still January, but, uh, but I'm, actually, I'm actually in better shape. Than Last week, I don't know, the January blahs had really gotten to me, but this week I think I'm back, hopefully. But it's good to have you all here today, just a, a, some announcements to get us started. A reminder, uh, or if you haven't been with us before, that there are some green prayer cards that should, you should be able to find in uh, the back of the pew in front of you. If you have a, a prayer that you would like to share to be lifted up in worship, uh, a celebration or a concern, we invite you to write those down, um, and those will be collected by the usher following the, the sermon, during the hymn following the sermon. Uh, also, if you haven't done so yet, there should be an uh, attendance book at the end of your pew in the center aisle there, and we invite you to take that and pass it down and uh, let us know who's here this week. And if you have um, address information that uh, you need to update of any kind, there should be a space to do that. Uh, if you have email and we don't have any on our email list, uh, put that there and let us know. I've got to remember to tell Kendra to watch for emails but, uh, so that we can keep our records updated as best as possible. Last Sunday, if you were here, when we talked about uh, an, an estimate of giving card for for this coming year, and they were included in uh, end of year statements for those who got the, uh, an end of year statement. If you didn't get one, there should be some on the back table here. And if you have one that's filled out and brought back, um, I invite you, you can just put those in the offering plate if you have one, uh, or you can leave it in the office, and those will go to our finance person who will kind of add those up and give the finance committee an idea of whether uh, um, of what our finances are looking like for this year. Um, I'm starting a, a study of the book of Revelation. It's not going to be a real in-depth study because that could go on for weeks and weeks. 
but it's kind of an eight-week look at the book of Revelation. That's starting tonight at 6.30 p.m. It'll be here in this room, and it, it'll be hour to hour and 15 minutes, probably, depending on how much feedback comes from, from all of you. Um, tonight's main, basically going to be a lot of background on um, interpretations of the book of Revelation and, and history up to this point. Um, we probably won't get into it too much tonight, but bring your Bible anyway if you have it, or we'll have Bibles here, and um, invite you at 6.30 to, to start that eight-week eight study with me. Uh, see Cowan Circle meets on Tuesday at uh, Chuck Arama for a no-host lunch, so you're invited to join them Tuesday at noon at Chuck Arama. Um, Becky has planned another Whitney family event coming up at the end of this month on Saturday, January, January 28th, a, a movie night. We don't know what movie, but there's information there about there'll be popcorn and stuff and bring, bring comfy chairs and things to sit on, and that's it's open to everybody. So um, join us on Saturday the 28th for that, and I didn't write the time down here. What is it? Six? Six o'clock. All right. And then a final announcement, uh, our, our secretary, Kendra, is going back to school. Uh, so we're working with her a little bit around her class schedule and, and the classes that she was hoping to take in the afternoon she couldn't get into, so she got a couple morning classes. So we're shifting our office hours. Uh, you'll see them in the bulletin. Uh, she, she will be in Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 to 1. And then she'll be in on Thursday afternoon from 2 to 4, uh, but not in any on, on Tuesday at all. So those will start this week, but with tomorrow being uh, a holiday, she actually won't be here tomorrow. So her first day in the office this week will be Wednesday. But uh, moving forward, th there'll be that shift in office hours. And uh, uh, I know it's kind of it's, it's confusing when office hours shift, but I appreciate you all uh, helping allow Kendra to to go back and take some classes. She's worked out some child care so that she can, um, can do that. And so um, that, that'll change will be taking place. Um, I think that's all that I have for announcements. Again, welcome. We're glad that you are here on this second Sunday after the Epiphany. And I uh, invite the choir now to uh, lead us into worship. Good morning. I'm Mary Kinzel and I'm your liturgist today. Could you please stand and join me in the call to worship? Listen up, everyone. God has given us work to do. God has called each of us before we were even born. 
It was God who named us. It is God who claims us. The light of God's love shines in us. Let's shine God's love into all the world. join me in the opening prayer. Open Open our our ears, O God, God, that that we we might might hear your your word speaking speaking to us in this this moment. Open Open our ears, O God, that that we we might might listen listen to your your voice voice, calling to us through scripture. scripture. Open Open our our ears, O God, that we might understand understand your promises to followers both both old and young, young, ancient and modern. modern. Open our hearts, O God, that we might enter into the love you offer us. Amen.
Our first scripture reading is 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9. Paul called to an Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Jesus Christ. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him, you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the second scripture reading is John 1, 29 through 42. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen him and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and he watched Jesus walk by. He exclaimed, look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and they saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Please join me. May May the the Spirit Spirit fill us us with wisdom wisdom and understanding understanding as as we we ponder ponder the the meaning meaning of these words for our lives. Thank you, Mary. Thomas Long tells uh, the following story. He writes, the youth group had just concluded its last performance of the living nativity, and everyone was gathering for a time of fellowship. Soon the pastor realized that he had lost track of his three-year-old son. Where's Nathaniel? He called out. He's with an angel, someone answered. They went out the door together. Walking outside, the pastor found them standing together at the now empty manger scene. The young woman in the angel costume looked up at the anxious father and said, he wanted to see Jesus. What is it that that brings you here this morning? I mean, there are so many other places that you could be today. There are so many other people who are somewhere else today. So what brings you here? Maybe uh, you're here because you've been forced or 
coerced into it by a parent or a spouse. Um, some of you might be here because it's, it's just simply part of your weekly routine. But many of you are here because you, you found something here. That this is a place where you feel at home. This is a group of people that feels like family to you and that, that supports you. Maybe you're here because you like to sing or maybe a couple of you show up because you like the sermons. Maybe some of you are here because there's cookies after the service and that's always a good thing. What is it? Whatever it is, many perhaps most of you, continue to come because you found something or someone with whom you've made a connection. And yet others of you may still be looking for that, that something. You know, it used to be that you could count on finding most Americans in a church on a Sunday morning, although it was not always by choice. The Puritans tried to legislate church attendance so that missing Sunday was a crime. It was a misdemeanor. Um, but legislation didn't work too well, but they did succeed in creating that standard that, that viewed missing church on a Sunday morning as, at, at the least, an antisocial act. Um, some even viewed missing worship as a sin. Over time, attending church became established as kind of a societal norm. Church was the place to be on Sunday morning. And then blue laws and societal pressure helped to keep stores closed on Sundays and football games and other sporting events off the TV so that nothing would distract people from attending worship. But most of that has changed now. While a few of those attitudes are still at work today, bringing people to worship on a Sunday morning, for the most part, society pretty much sees it as okay to not be at church on Sunday morning, especially here in, in the Northwest. Will Williman, who, who grew up in the South and in a different culture, dates a shift in attitudes towards church attendance to a Sunday evening in 1963, when he says, in defiance of the state's blue laws, the Fox Theater in Greenville, South Carolina, opened on a Sunday. That evening, he says, seven youth, regulars of the Buncombe Street Methodist Church Youth Fellowship, made a pact and slipped out the back door of the church to head to the Fox. He writes, that evening has come to represent a watershed in the history of Christendom, South Carolina style. On that night, Greenville, South Carolina, the last pocket of resistance to secularity in the Western world served notice that it would no longer be a prop for the church. There'd be no more free passes for the church, no more free rides. The Fox Theater went head to head with the church over who would provide the worldview for the young. That night in 1963, the Fox Theater won the opening skirmish. He goes on, our parents had never worried about whether we would grow up Christian. The church was the only show in town. On Sundays, the town closed down. Church, home, and state formed a, natu a, a, natural con a national consortium that worked together to instill Christian values. People grew up Christian simply by being lucky enough to be born in places like Greenville, South Carolina, or Pleasant Grove, Texas. Well, that may have been the situation then, especially in places like South Carolina or Texas, but that's certainly not the case today. No longer do people just show up on church on a Sunday morning because that's what society says that we are supposed to do, and that's the only thing there is to do. In fact, if anything, society these days tends to say just the opposite that there are so many other things you could be doing, there are so many other places that you could be, why waste it spending your time in worship? So that brings me back to my original question. Why are you here? What are you looking for? 
That's the question that Jesus asked those who followed him in the gospel story today. What are you looking for? It hadn't been that long since, John's, uh, since Jesus' baptism. He's just starting his ministry, and, and the way that John, the gospel writer, tells it, several people become curious about Jesus because of something that their leader, John the Baptist, tells them. John the Baptist uses two unusual and striking titles to address Jesus. He calls him Lamb of God and Son of God. Whereupon two of John's followers, two of John's disciples, leave John and begin to follow Jesus. At that point, Jesus turns to them and asks, what are you looking for? Now, usually when people talk about the call of God, they, they suggest that, that, that God's call comes in unexpected moments and, and in moments of surprise and intense drama. But William Mule, a professor at Yale Divinity School, sees a widespread tendency among ministers to do some pretty romantic editorial work on the nature of Christian calling. Mule says, to hear most ministers talk, God calls people only in moments of theatrical intensity. Someone, for example, is reading a theological book when suddenly a shaft of light falls upon a penetrating passage and scales fall from the reader's eyes. Mule says why he doesn't doubt that moments like that do occur, he doubts that they occur as often and as predictably as some ministers say they do. In fact, when I was going into ministry, one of the members of my congregation just couldn't understand that I didn't have one of these experiences to explain my call by. But today's lesson suggests that there is another way from these intense, dramatic, unexpected moments. That God calls us, that God meets us because we're just simply in the right place, seeking and looking like the two disciples. Two of John's disciples, hearing G, uh, John proclaim Jesus to be the Lamb of God, began to follow Jesus. Now Jesus recognized that they were looking for something and asked them, what are you looking for? Now if you spent much time reading the, the Gospels, you know that it's usually Jesus who gives peculiar answers to questions or answers questions with another question. But this time it's the two disciples who respond with that peculiar answer, that other question. What are you looking for, asked Jesus. And they replied, teacher, where are you staying? More literally, what they said, where do you abide? Now that word abide is an important word in John's gospel. It's used by Jesus to describe the relationship between him and God and to describe the relationship between him and his disciples. Abide in me as I abide in you. To their question, where do you abide? Jesus doesn't give a direct answer, but instead offers an invitation. Come and see. Which might suggest that what the disciples are looking for is not really an answer to a question. It's not a set of doctrines or a, thing, a set of things to believe in. But what they're looking for is someone to follow, a place to be, a place to abide. That's kind of an interesting thought. We've kind of, in modernity, been, been trained to look for answers. Um, and that's what brings some folks here. We're looking for answers to the great mysteries of life, the burning questions of the day. But this text suggests that Jesus offers us something other than, than answers, that Jesus offers us himself, his life, his presence. Where are you staying? Where do you abide? Come and see.
maybe, maybe there's a good model for evangelism in this passage. That inviting others into a Christian life isn't about giving them a lecture on the mysteries of the incarnation or defending any particular doctrine or dogma. That inviting others is simply an invitation to come and see. I had a man several years ago, I did a funeral for his partner and he was thinking about going back to church. He had all sorts of questions for me about what the United Methodist Church believed about a number of different issues and I just said, well, it's really, I mean, there, we have some statements, but it's really not about belief, it's about, it's about just coming and learning together. You know, I can give, I, I found that that's the best answer that I know to give when, when people come to me and ask about the church and the life of faith. I think you just have to kind of come and experience it and, and feel it. Um, the church isn't best understood through like kind of a, a nine point plan of salvation, <clears throat> excuse me, or through explanation of dog, dogmatic stances. I can't really describe what the life of faith is like for you. All I can do is in, invite you to come and, and experience and see for yourself. The best answer I can give to you about what the church is about isn't a book to read that's filled with answers, a long set of beliefs, but simply the invitation to come and join us and experience it and see for yourself. I think maybe that's evangelism at its best and most pure. Simply to say to others, I, I just believe, I, I feel like I experienced God in this place. Come and see if you feel it too. That's not only evangelism at its purest, but maybe that's also discipleship at its simplest. To be a disciple means to walk with Jesus, to come and see where he might take you. It's not about whether you believe in a literal or metaphorical understanding of the virgin birth or what doctrine of atonement you hold to. To be a Christian is to believe that in Jesus you find God. In a time when it's, when it's not necessary that we be here on a Sunday morning, We've come anyway. We've come because we're looking for, for someone to follow or looking for a place to be or maybe we're here because we've already found it. But in our seeking and in our searching, God meets us and sometimes God changes us. Thomas Long says of, of this text that was read today, here we see people stumbling along, following a presence they do not yet understand, discovering only belatedly and after the fact that the path they have ventured upon has led to the Christ. We see a portrait of a person being tugged along to Jesus by a brother, following more out of family loyalty than perhaps out of a sense of mystery, but finding at the end of the trail and not at the beginning that his name and his life have been transformed. And that says long, that's the way that it is with many of us. We're here because we're searching. Like the disciples in, G in this story, we've come to Jesus for different reasons. But we've come. We've come because we're looking for something. We're looking for something to believe in and to hold on to. Something important enough to live for something big enough to claim our passion, our devotion, our faith, an anchor, a purpose, and a meaning, a challenge to be more, a promise of love forever, a hope. Like Nathaniel, we are looking for Jesus. To everyone who's, who's looking for a place to belong, looking for someone to hold on to, someone to, something to believe in, 
Jesus invites you this day to walk with him. And come and see. Promising that he'll abide in you as you abide in him. Come and see. Let us sing together in response the song from the faith that we sing, Come and See. Please remain seated as we sing. Come and see. and share these concerns that have been shared by all of you as we enter into a time of prayer together. A prayer request for all the homeless and for the hungry. Lord, hear our prayers. Prayer request for the family of David Roth. Uh, this is Linda Sloop's uncle who passed away on January 7th. Lord, hear our prayers. And also from Linda, prayers for Jill Parmley, She's ill and waiting to get into a specialist. Lord, hear our prayers. And from Casey Larkachia, um, wisdom and discipline in regard to technology use, how to find and model appropriate use and not fall prey to time wasters and help in raising kids how to abide in a world with the internet and the pros and cons of technology. That's a, a challenge that parents are facing that my folks didn't have to face, but they do today. So Lord, hear our prayers. Let us, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Beloved God, you know us. You know us inside and out, and still you call us to follow and to serve you. We're often hesitant, afraid. We wish to remain hidden. Empower us to listen for and to hear your call. And empower us to answer your call with, here I am, Lord. Empower us to follow you when you call us to follow you. O Lord of mercy and justice, so many have gone before us working to bring justice and peace to our country and our world. Their footsteps seem, seem too big to step into to continue the work you have called us all to do. So, hesitantly we step, one step at a time, bringing your seeds of hope, justice, and peace in a world crying out for them. Lord of hope, we pray for our country, our leaders, especially in these tumultuous times. We pray for 
for healing of our country, for reconciliation, for forgiveness and peace, O Lord of hope. We pray for your compassion and your healing for those individuals in our congregations who need it and for those whom we carry in our hearts and care for. We pray for your comfort and presence for those who are grieving, who are lonely, who are oppressed. We pray for warmth, shelter, clothing, and food for those who are without. Lord, this day we say to you, here we are your servants, willing to share your word of love, to offer care where care is needed, presence where presence is needed, love where love is needed. Strengthen us for our ministry today and every day as we bring our prayers to you this day in the name of Jesus the Christ, the Lamb of God who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God has blessed us and called us to be a community that blesses others through the sharing of our love, our talents, our material possessions. So let us rejoice now in what has been given to us and in what is ours to give as we offer our gifts to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit. Holy Spirit, Alleluia, Alleluia, 
Let us pray. A generous God, you've already given us all that we need. Help us trust your continued care that we may share with others the abundance of your blessings. Strengthen us for service and remind us of the great joy that awaits those who answer your call. Accept our gifts and give us new songs of praise as we celebrate the opportunity to be in ministry. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to have a seat for a moment. Tomorrow is um, Martin Luther King Remembrance Day in the United States. Um, um, someone who felt the call of God in his life to work for, for peace and for justice in the world. Um, it's hard to believe that, that, that King was only 39 years old when he was assassinated, uh, when you look at all he, he's done. Um, several years ago, um, about seven or eight years ago now, the United Methodist Church interviewed some prominent United Methodists who, had, who, had, who knew Dr. King, who'd marked, marched with him or worked with him. And they um, did a short little clip of interviewing these people, speaking about their time with Dr. King. So I thought this morning, as we move into this time of remembrance, I would show one of those. There, there were several that were on the page. This is a, a Bishop Melvin Talbert who's talking. He's a retired bishop of the United Methodist Church now. He was, I think, in his 20s when he was working with Dr. King. But uh, just a, like a three-minute clip of him remembering his time with Dr. King, and so we'll show that video now. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. stood for equality for all. Many United Methodists valued his vision and his leadership. Bishop Melvin Talbert described King's impact on him and others. One day right bad in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I met uh, Dr. King personally back in 1960. I was privileged to be in the same jail cell with him for three days and three nights. I was very radical at that time. I know what it means to go into a lunch counter where it says white only, black only. And so some of us had said, we aren't going to continue to accept this. We're going to bring about change. So Dr. King, of course, was about the same kind of thing. And uh, being with Dr. King gave us a chance to express our views and to get his views because he was talking about something a little different than what we were talking about. We were talking about change. He was talking about nonviolent revolution. It was in those experiences that I said, you know, there is another way. And the other way is the way of love, the way of justice. What would I say to Dr. King? We need to do what you ask us to do. That is honestly living in good human relationships with each other across racial lines. I'm not sure that we'll get there in my lifetime, but all I can say to you, thank God it's not the way it used to be. And thanks be to God, there are those of us who can help shape what the future must be. And if I had a chance to talk to them, it wouldn't have been a big conversation. I would have just simply said, you know, I want to thank you for the impact that you've had on my life. You've made life worth living for me. Thank you. So, it's not the way it used to be, but there are those of us called to make sure it moves toward what it should be. So I invite you, as we close worship this morning, to, uh, to stand and join together in our closing hymn, number 436, The Voice of God is Calling. I invite you to stand as we sing.
The voice of God is calling, it summons in our day. Isaiah heard in Zion, and we now hear God say, Whom shall I send to succor my people in their need? Whom shall I send to loosen the bonds of shame and greed? I hear my people crying in slum and mine and mill. No field or mart is silent, no city street is still. I see my people falling in darkness and despair. Whom shall I send to shatter the fetters which they bear? We heed, O Lord, your summons, and answer here are we. Send us upon your errand, let us your servants be. Our strength is dust, <coughs> our years a passing hour, but you can use our weakness to magnify your power. From ease and plenty save us, from pride of place absolve. Purge us of low desire, lift us to high resolve. Take us and make us teach us your will and way. Speak and behold, we answer, command and we obey. And now go in the love of the one who strengthens us for the work to which we are called. Go in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, who claims us as sisters and brothers. Go in the community of the Holy Spirit who binds us together with all the saints. Go with grace to shine God's love into all the world. Amen.